everyone and welcome to the Compassionate Cowgirl Show where I teach you how to connect with your horse using compassion, innovation, and self-awareness. So I wanted to introduce you guys to a new series I'm going to be doing, um, which is called The Mystic Experiment. And in this experiment, I'm going to be working with Mystic, who is a previously wild Mustang from South Steens, Oregon, that was also previously untrainable. Mystic went through a training program that had been successful with tons of other Mustangs, but that didn't work with her. So I'm going to be restarting Mystic, helping her work through some trauma, helping her to accept someone on her back for the first time. Um, and here's the catch, <laughs> uh, literally. I'm doing it um, outside the round pen. I'm doing it in that huge field back there. So why, you may be asking, am I trying to start her out in that huge field and train her out there? Well, I did have her in this round pen right here and she let herself out and she's not very easy to catch um, at this point so i figured well i'm just going to take this as a sign that is pointing me towards learning how to gentle slash rehabilitate a mustang outside of the round pen now i'm also going to be working with mystic for the most part at Liberty. Um, and really with between that and not working with the round pen, really exploring what's possible in the horse-human connection and maximizing our horse's free will and really allowing Mystic to have the choice of interacting or not and how that then will impact our relationship. So I'm really excited to bring this experiment uh, to life. I know that for this to be possible, um, I'm really going to have to be willing to grow and try a lot of new things. And so one of the differences between how I'm going to approach Mystic versus a lot of the other Mustangs that I've gentled and rehabilitated is that I'm going to be placing a larger emphasis on positive reinforcement training and clicker training to be specific. So this is going to be a new approach and I've been studying it for a while now with different species like dolphins, wolves, uh, sea lions, crocodiles, and all kinds of interesting critters. But now I'm going to put it into practice with Mystic and have you guys be a part of the journey with me. So what we're going to do first today is go down to my office, talk a little bit more about the approach that I'm taking and what positive reinforcement is and how to apply it with our horses. And then I'm going to take you to the field with Mystic where all of the training sessions for this series are going to take place. And I'm going to introduce you guys to the tools that, are, that I'm going to be using with her um, throughout the training process since it's going to be a little bit different than perhaps what you've seen in the past. And finally, we're going to head back up to the house and have tea time where we're going to talk about uh, how these concepts apply at an even deeper level, exploring what's possible in the horse-human connection, um, and really all about kind of shedding old beliefs that hold us back. Because connecting with your horse begins with connecting with yourself. So I will see you guys in just a minute in the office. and talk about how this experiment is going to be a little bit different than anything I've done and how it's going to require me to take a different approach. So the last time that I did an experiment like this, I did it with Amira, who is my 2017 Mustang Magic uh, draw. And Mustang Magic is a competition in which you have about 100 days to gentle and train a completely wild horse. And at the end of the 100 days, you go to Fort Worth, Texas, and you compete and the horses are adopted out. Now, when 
I went to go pick Amira up from holding, a common practice is to run the horses down through the chutes, um, load them into the uh, stocks and put a halter on them there so that when you get home you have some sort of physical attachment um, with the horse. Well, I forgot my halter that day, so when I got back to the area I was going to be training Amira, I didn't have any kind of physical connection with her. And I spent the first few days getting a connection without any kind of ropes at Liberty. And that was going really well, so I decided to do an experiment with Amira in which I was going to see if I could start her at Liberty and actually teach her um, to carry me on her back, walk, trot, canter, riding, without her ever having worn so much of the halter, bridle, or rope around her neck. And it was a crazy idea, but what's even crazier is that it worked and I learned so much about two-way communication, trust building, and how our horses express their emotions, how to in how to maximize the horse's free will and honor the horse's free will in the training. So it was an amazing experience and I started replicating what I called the Liberty Start on other horses as well. Um, other colts, a Mustang I rehabilitated named Django and I had a lot of success with it. But I'm going to be using a different approach with Mystic because I'm going to be training her outside of the round pen. Now what also is going to complicate things and make it a little bit different than the process I used with Amira is that Mystic isn't a clean slate. She's already been through a training program. Mystic is a really sensitive horse and she really is going to hold on to any kind of experience that she's been in where she felt like she was near death, which isn't difficult for horses, especially a wild mustang to have that kind of experience because even a plastic bag they can't get away from can potentially be traumatizing for them if they feel like they weren't able to get away from it. So sometimes no matter what our intentions are, horses can develop trauma, not just wild horses, domestically bred horses as well. So my job with Mystic isn't going to be necessarily starting her, but restarting her. So before we dive into the science between the two different approaches, um, I want to go ahead and show you guys a little bit more about Mystic's story, where she came from, and what kind of training issues she was having. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, Mystic was three years old when we adopted her off the internet adoption. Uh, she is from South Steens Herd in Oregon. Uh, I've been involved in Mustangs since I was 18 years old and old enough to adopt. I've been tip training for years. I placed probably 30 in the past three years. She really didn't seem that different at first. She was okay in the shoots. They haltered her. We drove her home. She wasn't overly reactive in the shoot or in the pen, but it took a couple months to be able to touch her past her head and neck. And she's just always been very standoffish, very overly reactive. She was so reactive that she would rear and spin and just be gone. She's always been overly reactive. If the least little thing sets her off and that's her go-to, she rears and spins and bolts. Could be as simple as walking past a trash can that she's walked past a hundred times and one day she's terrified of it. I just, I kept hoping that over time and with more effort and more repetition it would stop and it's just not. We did about eight months of groundwork with her, having her wear a saddle, wear a bridle, work in the round pen, go over ground poles, had her bending nicely, giving to pressure. Had about 10 rides on her with no events. It, everything was great. And decided to take her out into the large arena for her first ride outside the round pen. And that was epic. I wish I had it on film. She walked very nicely and calmly. It's probably about 100 yards from the round pen to the arena. She head down, loose rein, walked right over there, walked right in the arena, walked the whole length of the long side of the arena and got to the back and exploded unstoppable, unturnable, ran back for the gate, realized the gate was shut, wheeled back around, ran back to the back of the pen, and she could see her pen from over the outside of the arena. I was convinced she was jumping it. I saw my rider's life flash before my eyes, and she didn't. She did some sliding stops and spins that would make a reigning horse jealous, and went flying back to the gate and stopped. And this whole time, the rider is trying to one rein stop her, trying to slow her down, trying to cease all the reins, get her attention, anything. She was like a runaway freight train. And she told me that she will ride anything, she will ride the buck out of any young colt, but she will not get back on this mare. <laughs> she told me that she needed a whole lot more work with somebody a lot bigger and stronger than her. 
I talked to two other big name trainers in Colorado and told them her issues and both of them said it's not worth your time there are other horses out there that are easier I can't risk getting hurt we won't take her I sent her to a small time trainer in the Springs a barrel horse trainer told her all her issues showed her some of her issues and she was like no problem I could do this a week and a half into it she said this horse is dangerous I'm not doing it uh, we've invested an entire year of time and effort and emotions and I just can't do it yeah. as for trailer loading I have a four horse stock trailer we had her practicing she would walk right in I have it on video we brought her here in a smaller open two horse stock trailer in what four or five times that we've had to move her in that trailer it is an epic battle every time to the point where she will rear and smack her face on the wall and like almost flip herself over backwards and so i only recently started talking with maddie but i've known of her for a while um the viral video of the mustang makeover all bridalists everybody knows of that i really was excited for her to give mystic a chance really breaks my heart this was her first horse that just we couldn't do anything with and in probably 20 years of working with Mustangs I've never given up I've seen Maddie do so much liberty training and resistance free that I'm really hoping that she can get through to Mystic when we couldn't all right, so pretty intense, and I am really grateful for Mystic's previous owners. Um, I have a lot of compassion for being in that situation where um, you have every intention of helping a horse and giving them the best life possible and uh, getting to the point where you feel like there's just not uh, much that you can do. So I'm really grateful that they reached out to me um, and I'm hoping that I can help Mystic and help figure her out and get her set so that she is understanding this human world a bit better and not just understanding it, but really enjoying it. So with that, let's go ahead and dive into the science behind uh, the different approaches we use with our horses and the approach that I use with Amira that's going to be different than the approach that I'm going to use with Mystic. When I talk about the different approaches, I'm really talking about the motivation. How am I going to motivate Mystic, who's out in a huge pasture, to interact with the training without any ropes completely at liberty, all right? So it's not like with Amira where I had a round pen. So understanding how a horse learns and what the motivators are is really important to understanding any aspect of horse training. So the best way to look at this, I think, is through the lens of operant conditioning. Now, operant conditioning is a form of learning in which the horse learns to respond and modify their behavior based on the behavior's consequences. There's two types of consequences for behaviors. There's reinforcement and there's punishment. If the horse is reinforced, that means that the behavior is increased, and if the horse is punished, that means the behavior is decreased. Now, uh, the easiest way to kind of organize this information is by looking at something called the learning quadrant, which is where we organize the two different forms of reinforcement and two different forms of punishment. There's two different forms of punishment and reinforcement based on whether we are adding or subtracting a stimulus uh, to reward or punish the horse. So with that being said, the terms positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement are not ethical connotations, but instead they're mathematical terms. It just means are you adding or subtracting a stimulus to influence the horse's behavior? So let's break this down. Let's start in the negative reinforcement quadrant. And so if you're looking at negative reinforcement, the negative means that you're subtracting a stimulus, right? And the reinforcement means that you're increasing the behavior. So naturally we would have to be taking away something the horse doesn't want that they want to avoid in order to reward a behavior, right? So that's symbolized by the stick here. So an aversive stimulus symbolized by the stick is something that the horse wants to avoid 
employed. So negative reinforcement is the most common technique in the horse industry um, for motivating our horses. Now we've really refined the use of negative reinforcement through natural horsemanship, which is learning especially how to get the horse responding before they even have to feel pressure or responding to the lightest amount of pressure possible. And it's really gotten people to a point of being aware of when they're releasing, when they're adding pressure and things like that. So an example of negative reinforcement is applying pressure on the reins. If you apply pressure on the reins to get the horse to stop and he stops, you release the reins, you reward the horse for stopping. Um, if you go to ask your horse to turn by opening your right rein or laying your neck rein, and the horse turns, then you're releasing and rewarding the horse for turning. Now, negative reinforcement can involve both physical and mental pressure. So going back to Amira's case study with her, um, in the beginning, just looking at her or even walking towards her was just as aversive as it would be to take a horse who had been handled all their life and apply a stick um, or a, uh, you know, opening a rein or applying pressure with the reins or the halter or whatever. So it's really important to be aware that the pressure can be mental as well as physical. Now, positive reinforcement, uh, let's go ahead and break that quadrant down. The positive means that you're adding something. The reinforcement means you're increasing the behavior. So naturally, that would mean we would want an appetite of stimulus, something that the horse wants more of, symbolized by the carrot. So a form of positive reinforcement training would be the clicker training with the horses. So when you're teaching your horse a behavior, you're going to use the click and treat to reward the horse. Now, positive reinforcement is much newer in the horse industry. We don't see a lot of people using clicker training. And I think that that has a lot to do with, well, several different factors, but one being that we have kind of this image in our head of a horse who's given food as being pushy and all over you and things like that. But those behaviors are going to develop from the horse's lack of training in regards to how they receive the food. Um, so there's lots of nuances about applying positive reinforcement and it is such a, a powerful motivator and our horses are big animals so we really have to learn the subtleties in order to be successful with it. Now I am going to be going over some of the nuances of positive reinforcement training throughout this series with Mystics so that we can hopefully encourage more people to give it a go. Now I first started using positive reinforcement about two years ago. I got into it originally with the zebras um, and exotic equines. I found much more success with the positive reinforcement training with them than I did with more traditional uh, natural horsemanship methods. And I got into it even more when I started rehabilitating mustangs versus working with mustangs who are fresh out of the wild. And I really started taking a deep interest in positive reinforcement with um, the most recent Mustang that I just rehabilitated named Willie. Willie was a 15 year old Mustang who had a chronic bolting issue. And positive reinforcement really, I think, was the turning point to where um, I really could get through to him. And he ultimately, I, I think that the positive reinforcement was the main reason for his successful transformation and rehabilitation. Now, I really wanted to understand and investigate the nuances of positive reinforcement training. So I decided to go where clicker training all began, which was with marine mammal training. And so I went and studied with marine mammal trainers uh, with dolphins, sea lions, crocodiles, uh, everything you can think of. And then I'm also going to a wolf sanctuary uh, this spring and studying positive reinforcement training with the wolves. So I'm now trying to bring back everything I'm learning into the horse industry um, and really trying to find the balance of negative and positive reinforcement with our horses. So I'm really excited about the potential of positive reinforcement and now I've been using it with all of my horses and I just love it. And I'm really hoping to encourage more people to give it a try. I think that it's gotten a bad rap in the past because of a poor application. Um, we didn't know the nuances of how to use food around horses and how to use the clicker around horses. And so that led to a lot of the fallout and then we kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak, 
and rode the whole thing off versus really taking a deeper look at what sort of subtleties and um, application errors that there were because there's no doubt that this is a really powerful motivator and in a lot of ways exceeds negative reinforcement in that aspect. So there's a lot of differences between positive and negative reinforcement and there are similarities but in a lot of ways positive reinforcement is really its own language. And so um, I've created a download for you guys if you are interested um, that kind of outlines some of these differences. And if you guys are wanting to go all in on it, then I would really encourage you to check out my five golden rules course, the five golden rules to the horse human connection, pretty much my life's work. And I organize all of this information I'm talking about into the course. Now let's go ahead and take a look real quick at the other two quadrants for punishment. Now punishment is not a part of my program, or at least I try to minimize using it as much as I can, but it is important to identify it. And the reason that punishment isn't a part of my program, well, there's lots of reasons, um, but one is that a lot of times punishment is going to just kind of solve a symptom. And if you don't get to the root cause of the behavior, another symptom is just going to pop up and the problem is never really going to go away. So lots of reason that, reasons that punishment has been proven to be ineffective, but let's go ahead and take a look here. Um, so negative punishment, let's look at that quadrant. So the negative means subtraction. The punishment means you're decreasing a behavior. So you're taking away something the horse wants, an appetite of stimulus, the carrot, right? So an example of this can actually come up when you're clicker training your horse. If you're having a clicker training session and your horse is finding the session really um, great and they love it and you know, you're, you're obviously that's what we want, right? Um, then if you abruptly kind of end the session, you could accidentally punish your horse because you're taking away, you're removing, you're subtracting something that the horse wants more of, which is more of the session. It's like taking away a kid's favorite toy. So when we go out into the field with Mystic, I'll explain that there's a special way that we end sessions using positive reinforcement so that we don't accidentally use negative punishment. Now, positive punishment, positive is adding a stimulus. The punishment is decreasing the behavior. So that means that you would need to be adding an aversive stimulus symbolized by the stick. So this could be hitting your horse, uh, whacking your horse, um, they do something and you spank them on the butt. Um, those are all examples of positive punishment. Now the difference between positive and negative or positive punishment and negative reinforcement, there's a lot of differences, but for one, the goal of negative reinforcement is to minimize the amount of pressure being used so that ultimately the horse is responding with no pressure or the least amount of pressure possible, just the lightest touch. And with positive punishment, you achieve the opposite. It actually gets to the point where you keep having to add more and more pressure to keep this behavior down. So if you hit your horse, you kind of hit your horse a little bit on the head one time when they go to nip at you or, or whatever, then you got to give them a bigger whack and then bigger, and then you have to keep getting bigger. It's a slippery slope. So, um, punishment can really uh, create a lot of lifetime coping mechanisms from our horses. And, um, for that and several other reasons, it's something that I don't like to use in my program. Okay, so now that we've covered the learning quadrant, hopefully the differences between positive and negative reinforcement make sense to you. Um, with Amira, my method in that experiment had been primarily negative reinforcement, and I was really exploring how subtle we could use pressure and how to really maximize the horse's free will um, using pressure and release. And with Mystic, I wanna take that a step further um, and also without a round pen, I really, my option is going to be positive reinforcement. Um, and we'll explain that a little bit more in the next episode. But with Mystic, I really want to explore maximizing free will and training even more. So positive reinforcement is going to be how I'm going to motivate Mystic to want to interact and engage in the training all at her own free will in a huge pasture. Now with Mystic and Amira, um, I started both of them at Liberty uh, because I, I like that it allows the horse to express their emotions fully um, and it really tells us if they're choosing to um, interact with us. Although uh, there are, you have to be careful with that because just because the horse is at Liberty doesn't mean that really aversive techniques haven't been used. But anyways, I like the horse to be able to express themselves freely. Um, I 
like that feedback. But the point of it is not to avoid the use of ropes, but rather to smooth uh, their transition into it, just like I did with Amira, um, because they have to learn how to respond to pressure being in a human world, right? So that's just a part of helping them learn how to survive um, in this world. In their world, they're told to react to pressure and to fight it and run from it. And in our world, they've got to actually learn how to think through it. If your horse is tied up to the trailer, you're at a horse show and they go to pull back and fight the pressure, get loose, run in the street and get hit by a car or kill someone driving the car when they hit them, you know, it's, this is really uh, dangerous for horses not to know how to respond to pressure. So even though Mystic is going to be at liberty much of the time that I'm training her, it doesn't mean that I'm going to avoid uh, teaching her how to respond to ropes. That's just going to be coming a little bit further along in her training um, so that I can gradually increase what I call their window of tolerance for how much pressure they can experience without going into a reaction. So it's going to make the transition into the use of pressure and into the use of ropes um, much less stressful. And my goal is always going to be to maximize her free will in the training and have her really choosing to participate in it. All right, I think that that's it. So let's go ahead and head out into Mystic's training area down in the pasture. And I wanna introduce you guys to the different tools I'll be using, cause it's a little bit different than the tools you've probably seen being used for negative reinforcement training typically. So I will go ahead and head down there and I'll see you guys in just a moment. So this is the area that I'll be training Mystic in. Um, this pasture is, I don't know, a few acres anyway. Um, and I kind of have a little training area set up here by the gate. Um, but this is where we'll be doing the training sessions with Mystic. Now, I wanted to go ahead in this session, we're not gonna go in and start working with her yet, that'll come in the next episode, but I wanted to explain to you guys the tools I'm using. Um, so I guess first thing I'll start with is the treat pouch. You wanna have a treat pouch when you're starting with the positive reinforcement training um, so that this kind of becomes a signal to your horse when you're doing a clicker training session and when you're not. So that's going to be important. And then what's in the treat pouch is also important. So um, I'm most mostly just using hay pellets with Mystic. Um, in some cases, I might add in a little bit of oats or something a little bit sweeter as kind of a jackpot, a treat that she really likes, especially when I'm um, doing work with counter conditioning where I'm having to really change her emotions about um, something, like if she's been terrified of the saddle pad and already has that negative association with it, I've got to kind of make her feel really good about the saddle pad. It's gonna require some more work um, and effort on her part, so that's when I would use uh, more of like a treat but for the most part I'm just gonna be feeding hay pellets um, timothy pellets alfalfa pellets that kind of thing um, so what I like about that is that she's really choosing to participate in the session because the session is engaging and this game of clicker training is fun and her seeking systems turned on um, because she can have free access to the grass out here. She's got a hay net, right? So I'm not necessarily her only source of, um, of the reward, right? So she doesn't have to perform in order to uh, get this thing. Um, so that's a little bit about why I'm choosing to use hay pellets. Plus you can feed quite a bit. You're gonna see me feeding pretty heavy quantities. Um, so you can, um, you know, that's an easy thing to feed. You don't have to worry about adding it into their diet as much. So um, next thing is the handheld target. Um, so this is going to be a main tool that I use. 
Um, and the handheld target is going to be uh, basically teaching her to target her nose uh, to this, but you can teach a horse to target any of their body parts to this. Um, and also just following the target too. So in a lot of leading exercises, I'll use this where she doesn't necessarily have to touch her nose to it, but she's following it and I'm clicking and treating for forward momentum and her following the buoy, not actually touching it. Um, but yeah, this has a ton of different purposes. So leading at liberty, um, have using this as a translator to get her to touch other objects like a halter or saddle pad with her nose and check them out. Um, so this is a main tool uh, that you'll see me using with the positive reinforcement training. Now, um, a, another thing that you'll see me using um, in a little bit is this target, which is different. This is actually a flag stick <laughs> and I wrap the flag up and put a uh, the top of a pool noodle on it which I don't know if I'll be able to get it back on here without a little bit of adjusting but anyway um, this is more of a following target so it's longer um, and this is what I would use more for teaching them circles using the target um, so we'll see this this will come into play with kind of some more uh, times where I just want her to be at a little bit of a greater distance or I'm looking to gain a little bit of speed and energy maybe and things like that. Um, so it's a little bit different than the handheld target. I'll put that back on later. Um, now uh, another target, so I guess this is um, like a, a third kind of target that I'll be using, is a cone, which for me is a stationary target. So I'm not really moving the cone around. It's going to be placed on the ground and she's going to be asked to send to it. Um, this is also the tool I'll use for my start button technique um, so that she touches the cone to tell me when she's ready for objects uh, to come or an activity to start. Um, and it's a really great uh, tool for teaching them to uh, send to multiple targets, which is an activity that you can use um, to kind of build their confidence with other behaviors. So we'll look at that in another episode. Um, but yeah, if you want your horse to even just send into the trailer, this thing is great. Um, so lots of different uses for the stationary target. Another stationary target that I'll use is the mat. And you can use any kind of mat. Um, that's I just like it to be something that's easy to move around. And the mat will come into play when I'm um, wanting Mystic to target but then just stay still on a stationary target and not necessarily keep touching the cone. Um, so you'll see this come into play especially for her mounting work. So I'll teach her to stand still for mounting using the mat. So it's kind of like uh, being used for a form of ground tying using positive reinforcement that gives her a visual of where to keep her feet. All right, so um, another thing that I'll be using is a feed pan, which this is going to be important because this is going to function as my end of session signal. So when I uh, want to end the session, I'm going to end on a behavior and then I'm going to give her kind of a jackpot, so a few handfuls of hay pellets and leave them in this feed pan, set it down, let her eat, and walk away. And what that's going to do is two things. It's going to let her know that the training is done, but also help um, help prevent any sort of negative punishment from arising. So remember earlier in the office, we said that negative punishment can occur when you take something away, subtract something away that the horse wants more of. So by ending the session in this way, you're taking care not to accidentally uh, use negative punishment. All right, so that is the majority of tools that you'll see me using, at least for right now. Um, another thing that will come up is protected contact and the reverse round pen. So you may see me using a reverse round pen when I'm um, asking Mystic to get forward and teaching her circling and lunging and things like that. Um, so that's something that might come into play as well. And I really encourage you guys, if you do start positive reinforcement training with your horse, you can do a lot through what's called protected protected contact. Um, so I really prefer to work with horses through protected contact, through a fence, through a stall guard, um, some sort of barrier, even if the horse is tied. As I'm teaching them different behaviors like tree receiving mode, standing quietly, and touching the target, um, because at first they don't know to not be in your space and be all over the food. It makes sense to them, well there's the food, I'm going to go right towards it with my nose and start mugging you. So you don't want to 
um, you know, practice that behavior. You want to kind of get some of these behaviors going before you work without the protected contact. Um, so you'll learn more about that um, in the membership if you're interested on how to start positive reinforcement training with your horse. So um, I'll give you guys the link below for the Academy membership, um, but that kind of walks you through the step-by-step -step process of introducing positive reinforcement to your horse in a safe way. All right, so I think that that's all the tools for now. Um, you'll see me using kind of maybe more standard tools um, as we proceed with the training and as she builds up this window of tolerance for being able to handle pressure. Um, but right now her window of tolerance is very small. Um, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and head back up to the house. We're going to have a cup of tea and talk about taking these things a little bit deeper exploring what's possible with our horses and finding out what beliefs are holding you back. So I will see you guys up at the house. So I hope you guys enjoyed that first little session out in the field um, talking about the tools that I'll be using. Um, and I wanted to come back in here and talk to you a little bit more about our perceptions of what's possible. So to many, what I'm trying to accomplish restarting Mystic successfully out in a huge field at Liberty um, probably sounds crazy and impossible. I want to talk to you guys on this and I wrote something when I started Amira at Liberty, um, like we were talking about earlier. And I wrote something about kind of what what I perceive as impossible. And so I want to kind of talk about this a little bit more in depth with you and talk about some beliefs that can be limiting and then kind of, yeah, dig deep into that with you guys. So um, this is what I wrote. Impossible is an opinion held by those who do not wish to seek more. Impossible is potential to grow in extraordinary ways, and perhaps if something is said to be impossible, it just hasn't been imagined yet. So, yeah, this like popped up today. It was perfect timing. And I feel like that kind of explains um, exactly this question that we should be asking ourselves. So instead of asking ourselves, is something possible or not? We should be asking ourselves, are we willing to change and evolve and grow in these uncomfortable ways? And a big part of that is letting go beliefs that no longer serve us. So I have an example of this and how it worked out for me. Um, so not too long ago, I was rehabilitating Willie, who was a 15, that 15 year old Mustang I was talking about um, that had this chronic bolting issue. And he would push his way through anything like you, your personal space, uh, through the bridle. Uh, he was just very pushy. He had this very pushy behavior. Now at the same time, I was also working with Zeus, who was a pretty aggressive um, zebra, who was not just pushing, but exhibiting even more dangerous behaviors. Um, and so with both of them, really, I think that their rehabilitation um, and training would have been impossible if I would have stayed where I was with my current beliefs. And there was one big belief that was blocking me from helping them with their transformation. And that was that at the heart of all training is that we need to earn our horses respect and that Willie's pushiness and Zeus's pushiness and perceived dominance was coming from a lack of respect. 
And when I held that belief, um, basically I was masking what the true cause of the behavior was, which that it was coming from a place of fear. And so it also blocked me from being able to help the animal work through it. And so once I let go of that belief, which was really kind of an experiment, I was like, well, this isn't working. You know, if I were to just increase the pressure, for example, with Zeus, the zebra, um, he would continue to bite, strike, rear, uh, kick and things like that. So I was when I diagnosed it as this lack of respect, then the uh, solution seems to be to increase pressure to earn the horse's respect, right? And so when that wasn't working, I said, well, I'm just going to give this positive reinforcement thing a go because I got nothing to lose. And so to many, using food rewards and positive reinforcement with a horse that will bolt through anything and run you over and a zebra who is showing a severe aggression, that seems crazy, right? Um, but it worked. And that told me that, oh, this behavior is not a result of a lack of respect. Um, and I was able to address the fear and work through it with the positive reinforcement. So that's ultimately what led to both of their transformations. Now with Zeus, for example, um, I can just lean towards him and he will back up 15 steps um, with no trying to bite, strike, anything like that. And Willie turned into an amazing amazing horse who is adopted out and now is just in the best home ever and has these little girls riding him and does therapy sessions with their clients um, and things. And so their transformation was only possible because I was willing to go outside of my comfort zone and give up these beliefs that I had held on to um, for a long time and question those beliefs um, and realize that I took these things that um, I had learned as my ultimate truth. And I was able to see in hindsight how they were holding me back, but I had to question those beliefs and had to be willing to give them up, which can be really scary um, because we think we've made sense of our world, right? And then we realize that Oh my gosh, I've been told for years, for example, that I have to wash my hair with really damaging sulfate based shampoo. Um, like we were just told these things that we don't uh, necessarily question because it's easier sometimes to just take it as truth. So challenging these long held beliefs can be really scary um, because it, it kind of causes this domino effect too, where we're like, well, if that's not true, then this isn't true. And then that wasn't true. And then it's like our whole rea we're questioning our whole reality and how we've made sense of the world. Even though it's scary to do, it is so important to question our beliefs and to uh, question them so that we know what beliefs are no longer serving us because your your beliefs literally create your reality and your experience of the world. So um, basically when you believe something, you're going to act in a way that's going to confirm um, and, and give evidence towards that belief. So we've seen this in so many ways. There's, you know, lists of evidence, but the placebo effect, for example, when people who get a sugar pill instead of the actual drug, uh, you know, end up feeling better or whatever. Um, so the power of the mind, basically, when they think that they're given a drug that's supposed to make them feel better, they end up feeling better. Um, so the beliefs determining the reality. Um, another example, well, the self-fulfilling prophecy, right, which is kind of an umbrella term for all of this. Um, another example is with the, the Pygmalion effect from the Rosenthal studies, which was basically a teacher was giving, given a group of students um, and they were told that these students students were just above average geniuses and then uh, they really didn't test any differently than the other kids but the teachers uh, that believe caused the teachers to treat those students differently and give them more attention and it, it um, you know determined their perspective about the kids so if a kid um, she called on a kid to answer a question and the kid 
pause, she'd be like, oh, look at Johnny, you know, he's so smart. He really thinks before he speaks. And if it was another kid, the perspective would be more like, oh my gosh, he's really, he doesn't have this yet. You know, we've been over this so many times. And so it, our beliefs in that way, again, determine how um, we behave towards others. And it's just this self-fulfilling prophecy that comes up. Now, um, I have a whole lot of other examples too, um, but I don't know if you guys ever um, read the book Alexander and the Terrible, No Good, Very Bad Day. Um, I, yeah, grew up reading that book and it's so funny because it's, you know, it's this kid who gets out of bed and, you know, something wrong happens and it taints his whole day. So he believes it's going to be a bad day and then he gathers all of this evidence along his day um, why it was bad. He got gum in his hair, his bath water wasn't the right temperature, you know, all these things. Um, he had to sit in the middle of the back seat. Um, and so when you wake up and you're like, oh yeah, this is going to be a bad day. I can already tell. Self-fulfilling prophecy, beliefs determine your reality. You're going to go throughout the day collecting evidence of why it's bad. Um, we'll cover that in a second, how you can get out of that trap. Um, the This one was big for me, um, for sure. Uh, I have to do everything if I want it done right, right? So not wanting to accept support. So when you have that belief, and I have seen this, I've done this, um, I'll have someone helping me. But because I have this belief, I'm gonna act in a way that supports that belief, right? So I'm probably not going to communicate very well to the person helping me. So then they're not going to get the outcome I wanted, right? Because I didn't communicate it properly um, and effectively. And so then it's going to confirm that belief that I have to do everything myself if I want it done right. Um, another one, this person I'm dating or seeing isn't relationship material. So you're not going to put the time into them and the effort into the relationship. And so then obviously it's not going, it's not going to be a long-term thing. Um, here's one back to our horses. So my horse is lazy, that belief. You're going to collect evidence that the horse is lazy and the horse is going to keep being lazy because you're collecting all of this evidence supporting it and you're, it's blocking you from understanding that it's really a lack of motivation or the horse is shutting down and is in terror and you're, you're not able to see that. But your label and your perception of the behavior, your belief is blocking you then from finding the solution. So your horse is gonna keep on going lazy. Um, oh, this is a good one. I didn't write this one down, but this one's so good. So I was listening to a book called Nonviolent Communication, um, and it was talking about this couple, and the woman was like, my husband is like talking to a stone wall, and you know, da, 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 and see, and she turns to her husband, her husband's just like, <laughs> and, uh, the the facilitator is like well you know you're kind of convert you're you're acting in a way where he feels like he needs to shut down even more right so the woman um, in this way was blocking off trying to understand him um, which was really that he didn't know how to exactly express his emotions or felt he couldn't right and and things like that so instead of trying to understand him and what his needs were, she said, see, he's a stone wall. And so obviously he's gonna keep being shut down and being a stone wall because that makes him feel even more closed off and less understood. So that's a good example as well. Um, yeah, those kinds of labels really block us off from the understanding, right? So again, just the belief determining our reality self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so what are my tips? What are my tips for you guys and things that have helped me? Um, first of all, understanding what is a belief and what is like an absolute truth. So if it's a belief, a lot of times it's going to be subjective. There's some sort of judgment with it. And um, then the other thing is you can look at that belief and this is kind of my second tip is ask, where did that come from? Because a lot of times they aren't really ours. We inherit them and take them as truth. So um, if our parents worked their butts off and got up at 
4 a.m. to go to work and worked, you know, 17 hour days. And then on the weekends, they're on conference calls. And, you know, when we're doing our soccer game, dad, do you see that? And he's, you know, on, on the phone uh, doing a business thing. It's like we get the idea that to be successful, we have to work really, really hard. And so, um, and we have to sacrifice, right? Like seeing our kids grow up and, and things like that. So, um, that's a belief that we can get from our parents, right? Um, and we get these beliefs from all over the place, but a lot of times we realize that they aren't really ours. Um, and they're not serving us. So the third um, tip that I have for you guys is to change the belief into something positive. Um, so it's even if you don't, um, even if you don't necessarily believe it, um, because here's the thing, when you shift it to a positive, even if you don't necessarily believe it yet, um, the more you say it, the more your brain is literally going to develop these new neural pathways and look for evidence to confirm it. So for example, um, if your belief is money is hard to make, then you change it into money is easy to make, um, uh, believing in abundance rather than scarcity, right? And so you are, you are going to find uh, maybe possibilities, avenues of making money that you didn't see before because you're in this mentality, money is hard to make, and you realize that there is all these other ways that, you know, opportunities presenting themselves where you could be earning money for your time. So anyways, that's um, another tip. And then tip number four, I really like this one, is trying to say out loud three things you're grateful for before your hit your hit your feet hit the floor in the morning so in the past i would be laying in bed and i don't know if any of you guys do this you can comment below if you do um but be laying in bed and it's like before i get out of bed i'm thinking about okay everything i have to do today and oh my gosh there's not enough time and i'm already in this scarcity mindset of there's not enough right and i'm focusing on what i don't have and what i need to get done and accomplish um, versus saying these three gratitudes, it, it switches your brain into thinking things that you already have and that you're grateful for. And now you're focusing on these things that you're grateful for. And the more you focus on those things the more they're going to grow, which kind of leads us into the next tip, um, which is uh, your list of wins. So one of my journal exercises, um, I love to write in a journal. And one of my journal exercises is listing out my wins for the day. So whether it's in the evening or the next morning, but there's this saying, uh, what you appreciate appreciates. So basically the more you're focusing on all the good in your life, the more of that you're going to attract into your life. Right. Um, so those are my tips. And then what I want to do is hear from you guys. Um, this will be our question of the day that I would love for you guys to answer in the comments below. And um, what I want to know is what is a belief that's holding you back? Um, and so I have a whole list <laughs> uh, to give you some ideas. Um, so one would be to be beautiful is to be skinny. Once I make a hundred thousand, I'll be happy. Once I win some sort of award, I'll feel worthy. Uh, there is never enough money. Uh, success and um, obtaining goals requires hard work, sacrifice, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, you can't make a living doing X, starving harvest type thing. Uh, asking for help is weak. Showing emotions is weak. You can't trust anyone. It's a dog eat dog world out there. Um, uh, or if you want it done right, you have to do it yourself, which we talked about earlier. I don't have time. And by the way, if you're saying that I don't have time, that was so me. I was so big on time stuff. Oh my gosh. Anyways, book that helped me was the one thing. And he actually talks about how um, busyness uh, and lack of time is actually a form of laziness because you're not taking um, the effort to look at your priorities uh, so it's all about prioritizing. It's not really a lack of time. It's how you spend it. Um, so that's a really good book if you struggle with that. Um, I'm too old. I'm too young. 
Uh, I've gotten a lot of the too young. <laughs> now is not the time. Um, I'm unlovable. I'm not worthy of X, Y, Z. And here's one you might not have thought of. I don't know. That's a belief. I don't know. And when you're in the mindset of I don't know, you're going to be blocked off from knowing the answer. So if you're, you know, working on making a difficult decision or whatever, and you say, I don't know, um, it's yeah, changing that to, I am open to receiving guidance and understanding and clarity about this is going to align your brain to then look for uh, evidence to support that the answer is going to come to you. Um, so yeah, and then I do know, you know, the other extreme then blocks you off from, you know, receiving and things like that. But anyways, um, so there's a long list for you guys to go off of if you're feeling kind of stuck on that. So maybe some of those resonates with you. Maybe it's something else. Um, and I know that this is a pretty like deep question. It's our first time together, but, um, I'm going to take it pretty deep, uh, in each of these, uh, tea time sessions. So I, I want to tell you guys that if you're really introverted and you're not really wanting to comment and you're like, well, I'm just going to think about it. Cause that's probably what I would do. I'm super introverted by the way. Um, it's really, it, it's when you go out of your comfort zone and you leave a comment and you like reply. Uh, what that does is that by doing that, you helped, even if it's just one person out there, feel less alone on their journey. This is stuff that we, I feel like don't talk ab enough about, right? And so by being vulnerable on here, um, you're, you're allowing others to feel less alone in their experience and you have no idea how much of an impact that that could have on someone. So I really appreciate your guys' participation. I know we're like just getting to know each other and I'm like, tell me your fears, <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be great. So I can't wait to get to know you guys and to see what you're saying on there. Now in the next episode, uh, what I'm going to be covering is how I'm going to go ahead and start building a connection with mystic, um, and <clears throat> how you could approach building a connection with any horse who was previously hard to catch um, using positive reinforcement since I'm outside the round bend, right? So we'll talk about the different techniques of catching a horse and getting that initial connection and draw with them. Um, but with Mystic, explore how to do that outside of the round pen. Um, so that's the plan for the next episode. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. And then once you hit the subscribe button below the little bell, cause that will send you guys a notification when that video is out so that you don't miss it. Um, also, if you guys wouldn't mind sharing this, taking a screenshot, sharing it to your Instagram story or Facebook or whatever, if this resonated for you guys. If you think that following this journey and this episode would help someone that you know, I would appreciate your help in getting the message out. Um, and then finally, if you want to follow Mystic's journey in even more detail, um, then make sure to check out the Academy membership and you can get more Mystic time on there. Um, also, if you're interested in starting positive reinforcement training with your horse, that's a great resource as well. So I think that that's it and I will see you guys next week. Thank you guys for tuning in and have a great rest of your day.